Welcome to the On Point Podcast, a channel dedicated to helping you be the best hunter you can be. On Point is designed to help motivate and inspire you to get more out of yourself and your gear during your next hunt. If you're looking for information that will directly impact your success and help inspire you to go on new adventures, whether you're hunting with a bow or a rifle, On Point is the channel for you. Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of the podcast where Royce Chambers and I get to sit down and talk about common archery mistakes. These are things that I still do, that I work on all the time. You know, no one's above the basic foundational principles of archery. And this episode really, really hits home on some of those foundations, picking your lane, running in it, and just building your own shot process, but following some good foundations along the way to help make you the most accurate shot you can be. So Royce Chambers and I go over our top five things that we think uh, you could work on or learn from, things that we still work on, like I said, and it's a lot of information for beginner archers to experienced archers, it, whether it's learning something new or it's just a reminder of what to work on. A lot of great information on this episode. So I'll see you guys at the end. Enjoy. I've been I've been avoiding this topic for a while, but um, you know because it's a great way to get shredded online. <laughs> there's so many different opinions out there. Um, there's so many different. Just yeah, I mean, go on, guys, archery, go you, on archery talk and look how to get flamed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, there's a reason I quit going on there, and it's because I posted about um, archery uh, minutes of angle. I, I said MOA because I'm like I'm on an archery form. I don't need to say AMOA. Right, and I got torn up. Bows aren't rifles. What are you talking about, MOA? I'm like, clearly, everybody on here is an expert and doesn't know their ass from a tea kettle. So, right. Um, I haven't been on there since, but um, my videos get posted on there, which is kind of cool. Yeah, they you do. Me that I saw one of your videos on there. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, we're just covering, I think we're each going to pick maybe like five of our. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of them will overlap. Yeah, I, you know, and if you guys need to go, don't don't worry. It's not you're not going to hurt my feelings by leaving early. This will be up on YouTube. It'll be on the podcast. I think Royce is going to co-upload it. Yep. Yeah. So yep. we got a couple of co-uploads going yeah. here. So uh, this is going to be common mistakes made by bow hunters uh, for shooting process, shooting tips, and stuff like that. I would go, yeah, bow hunters. Bow hunters. Rather than, yeah, target. I'm not going to give target shooters okay. any tips. Okay. Um, so things that I see in, in, in the first – I'm just going to kind of regurgitate what we did in the video because it's still valid. Oh, can you let me kick it off? Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to kick it off. Improper <laughs> draw length. Ah, ah, very common. That's my first – first one because i too have i always float around draw lengths like i'll go from 28 and a half to 29 down to 28 a longer d loop shorter d loop put a twist in a cable or a twist in a string excuse me constantly messing with draw length and you can correct me if i'm wrong you're the archery guy <laughs> i just shoot stuff with a bow sometimes but if you are anchored in the incorrect position yes you can cause what you talked about earlier, yeah. facial pressure, yeah. improper anchor points, mm -hmm. improper releasing, all this stuff mm -hmm. can, and I mean, bad form, you, can. you know, all that can be caused from an improper draw length. Right. So that's my number one, I think, is, is, your, is improper both set up as a whole, but more than anything, I think, improper draw length. That's very common, and I see it all the time, and I don't know why, and I have an idea why, but usually it's too long of a draw length, yeah. more than it is too short, and I think what guys are doing is that, they're, is that they're chasing speed, and with these new bows nowadays, you know, I, I chase speed too, but I buy the bow, and I, you know, I, I yeah. buy a turbo sure. that gains me 5 to 10 feet per second over what I would be shooting, but I'm shooting the correct draw length. I'm not sure. buying uh, a fairly fast bow and then going too long and or there going was too light to or going too speed. light and what guys are doing you know what some guys have done in the past you know they've used overdraw bows to get that speed up uh you know you'll see some guys anchor way back here you know cameron haynes uh, that's how he shoots he shoots with his with his thumb back here um is he shooting wrong no i'm not going to say he's shooting wrong he's no. shooting in his lane the and guy the guy hardly ever misses anything. No, he's a great shot, and yeah. I, you know, I, I've I've shot next to him. I've shot, seen him shoot. You know, he, he's legit. And 
that he's running in his own lane. And right. where you're going with, with that, what reminded me of somebody that, is that one that Vegas shoot. And he recently just actually had it stripped from him, but he was shooting a Martin bow. And his draw length and everything, it looked bad. It looked way too long and yeah. stuff like that, if, if I remember right. But he was still able to be consistent, and he was still able to duplicate his shot process. Now, when we get into this episode, you're going to hear me talk about consistency, and you're going to hear me talk about duplication over and over and over and over again because you know principles don't change. <laughs> right. Well, Fads archery do. Archery is a simple principle. Right. Right. Draw the bow. Draw the bow. Put the pin where it's supposed to go, and release. make and release the arrow. Yeah. And the arrow goes where the pin goes. Yeah. Assuming that your bow's set up. Not even set up right. Your bow could be completely out of tune, <laughs> set up incorrectly, right. wrong draw length. Right. If you consistently anchor to the same exact spot and consistently release the same exact way, right. wherever that pin is that you have sighted in, the arrow is going to go there. The, the tail of the arrow might point one way or the other if right. you're real out of tune, but the point of the arrow is going to hit where the pin is. Well, somebody said uh, that pro shops aren't doing anybody any favors, something like that. And, uh, you know, I find that, you know, talking to guys like Jimmy um, over East is that they, they, they use mechanicals almost as a crutch or a shortcut versus getting a good tune. Yeah. Um, and and for, for reasons like that, you know, they're just getting people out way quicker. You got to think about the bow hunting capitals of the USA, pretty much Pennsylvania. I mean, that's sure. where yeah. when they're designing bows, Matthews is designing bows. And I don't really think they're thinking of the guys over here. They're thinking of a guy in a tree stand over in Pennsylvania. And that's why you're getting a 4.8 pound bow, right. <laughs> you know. So, uh, But I, I shoot a heavy bow better. You do well. I would rather have a light bow and put the weight where I want. Yeah. Then start with a freaking heavy bow. Of course. Bow. I shot that halon, and then uh, you know I carried it around, around in the wilderness for a year. My buddy had to chill. Yeah. And um, I had to carry his bow for a second, and I was like, "What am I doing?" Same thing happened. It was with like me. over a pound yeah. difference, yeah. and then but it doesn't sound like a lot. But when you're doing six, eight, ten miles mm-hmm. in crappy country. A lighter bow really does help, and I know we're in a rabbit hole here. But we are. That's, um, that's the podcast game. But it is. Uh, so draw length. Totally agree. Um, it's it's very important to have that. Is it an end all be all? No. You can have a short draw length, and if I'm going to be off on my draw length, I'd rather be short than long. Yeah. It's easier to draw. It's easier to anchor. Um, you. I feel like you can be more consistent and duplicatable with your shot process. You're not going to struggle to find your anchor as much because you can still anchor off your jawline rather than finding a spot back off your ear. Um, you know, but in a perfect world, shoot the right, shoot the correct draw length. And for different bows, guys, draw lengths may be different. Okay. So for Hoyt, a 28 is a 28. For yeah. Matthews, 28 could mean 28 and a half. Yeah. 28 and a little bit of change. I mean, sure. so I shoot a uh, 28 and a Hoyt and then a 27 and a half and a Matthews. Yeah. And I shoot a 28 and a half and a Hoyt mm-hmm. and I'm a 29 on my elite. Are you? Yeah. Wow. I think it's because of the... The uh, limb stops compared to the cable stops. Very possible. Because the Hoyts give you a little extra, I mm-hmm. think, on the sponge. There is a little bit of sponge on them. And, uh, <laughs> you know, even when I went back and shot my Halon, when I first bought my Halon, I'm like, man, this thing has such a solid back wall. But going back and shooting it, yeah. there's there's sponge there. There I are mean, sponges. As the bows get better, you can pick apart the bows that were amazing three years ago. Sure. And it's just really cool to watch. But uh, So my first one would probably be... <laughs> the most common common thing, I, and I was wanting to save this later, but it's going to come out now because it's my number one, is uh, a crappy shot process. Yeah. Uh, you you were way too committed, way too early in your shot. You're punching the trigger. It's target panic. And what you're doing is you're developing bad habits from the beginning. And actually, maybe I can put that off and go back to the release. Choosing the wrong release. I shouldn't say the wrong release, but a release that will not allow you to build good habits. And I'm talking about the caliper releases that have a Velcro wrist strap. They have a uh, a bar that's that long. You got, it's, you got the, yeah, the I've safety got one, release. I've got a safety there. release right here. It's got a bar that's that long, and you have to reach to go out and get that trigger. Well, that's not building any good habits. Right. That takes so much mental like toughness to be able to fight the feeling of punching that trigger. I don't care how long you've been shooting. If you, you use one of these things. Do you have a hinge up here? Uh, my hinge is in my truck. I could run downstairs and grab one. Um, oh, but that's for the video. Yeah. You know. Um, but, you know, choosing the proper release. If you're going to choose a caliper release, there's nothing wrong with it. But at least choose one to where you can bring that thing in. And my release sits right here in my hand. Yep. That's how and my so do. when I wrap it around and I pull back, it's about right there. And then I'm executing my shot with about that part of my fingers. 
and there goes like that, and I squeeze and pull back my elbow. Nowhere in that process am I going wham, and I'm punching it harder than freaking Mike Tyson. There's nowhere in my <laughs> shot, shot process where you're punching a trigger. And when I say don't do that, you typically won't hear me say that, but don't do that. That's not even on the track of foundational principles of archery. Right. Well, That's in know, left freaking field. A lot of guys, if you watch a lot of hunting videos, yeah. like a lot of guys whack the shit out of a trigger, <laughs> and it still works. It still works just yeah. fine because they have – I think for me it came – when I first started shooting, punched the shit out of the trigger all the time. Everybody does. I did hardcore, but what changed was I started getting into archery. Compare, I think that you could consider archery and bow hunting two different things. Mm-hmm. And I got, I was still into bow hunting, of course, but I got more into archery for bow hunting. Hmm. And so what that did was then you start searching down. Well, I need to create this perfect shot process, mm-hmm. and that goes in with your release, right? I had a mm-hmm. caliper that had like probably an eighth inch of trigger travel. There's no way to really accurately for me, at least to squeeze through that without wanting to whack the crap out of it. Right. So I think when I started learning about how you're actually supposed to do it, if I had never learned how you're supposed to do it, I'd probably be a far better shot right now. You would never know if someone never told you or showed you. Right. I still, I'd still probably, and that was when I was better. Like I had no thoughts of, Oh gosh. Oh, I'm going to whack it. Right. No, I, it just went where it was supposed to go. Right. And now, now I'm like, I'm a basket case when it comes to, you know, shooting different things. I hunted with a hinge this year because I did not trust myself enough to make a good shot process with anything besides a hinge. And you can still punch a hinge. You can still punch it. You can manipulate it. Um, you know, granted, I th- I do honestly think it is harder in wind um, than a caliper or a trigger style release. But you can you can manipulate that thing just like you can a trigger and get it to go off when you want it to go off. I understand the, up. the harder in the wind thing. <laughs> But if you're executing a proper shot with any release, any release, you're going to miss the same exact way with a trigger, with a thumb trigger, with a back tension, with a hinge, any release you're shooting if you're executing the shot right, pulling through. Right. You're going to miss every single time in the same exact way right. whatever release you're shooting. Well, I you know guys say that, you know, a lot of guys say that the hinges are no good in the wind and to add on to your point is I follow up that with a question I'm like, "Why?" cuz then they're telling me that I'm punching it in the wind. And granted, I punch the trigger a lot in the wind, and I still fight the urge to do that. And I did it in Africa, and it didn't end well. And uh, long story short, you know, I work on target panic more than guys who probably have target panic because it's it's not a battle you win. It's a war you have to keep fighting if you're going to shoot a bow. Target panic. And that's sure. the whole – that's pretty much 90% of what we're going to talk about people doing wrong is target panic. Well, all things, all things put together that can lead to that, right? Uh-huh. Can we get into, so, I don't know how deep we want to get into this, but you're saying using the wrong release. Can we tie in using the wrong release method with that? Sure. Okay, so anybody that's watching or listening, um, I would assume, I, I would probably say 50 plus percent of you didn't start out shooting a hinge unless you started out in target archery. Right. Um, you probably got your regular straightforward caliper release. And what we mean by that is it's got a trigger on one side and two jaws that separate and the string releases straight out of the center of it. Correct. So there are really good uh, trigger style releases that have a sear, that have a hook style and a sear, Mm -hmm. and they break at whatever poundage you set them at. Mm -hmm. My short and sweet. Right. Yeah. I just uh, ordered an RX-1 not too long ago, Carter. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I'm hoping I can get that heavy enough. Yeah. Because, yeah, that's... Then I could practice with a hinge, shoot that. Anyways, um, so assuming you guys all started with that, I would assume that 99.9% of anybody listening whacked the crap out of the trigger the first time. I would absolutely. I didn't learn how to shoot a bow until even just a few years, probably four years ago. I, yeah, I would I say- shot bows for years, and then I was working with the guy at our shop, uh, John, and he was a, you know, I think he was a triple crown champion. He was a national champion. He's a beast. And uh, amazing archer, amazing archer. And, uh, you know, he, he, you know, I was shooting in the range with him and I was trying to show off and press him and stuff. And then he's like, you know, you shoot, you shoot good. And I told him, and I was, I was actually going, you know, I was going there to learn and I, right. I sought out his help because I'm like, man, I shoot good, but I want to shoot better. Right. And he's like, let's, let's, you do, you shoot good. But he's like, your off days are going to look like this, right? You know, you have your off days, and if you have your off days in archery, you know you have you have a day where that pin just won't settle. Your groups are like this at like 
whatever, X 60, 70 yards. He's like, my days, I have off days too. My off days are like this. Yeah. He's like, that's the difference between a guy like you and a guy like me. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, a guy that's properly executing a shot and a guy that's not. And then I'm like, oh. And it kind of just made me, it tossed a a gear in my my brain. I'm like, I need to, I really need to learn how to shoot a bow. Like, yeah, you can do it really accurately wrong or maybe not proper, but you are going to gain those extra couple puzzle pieces to put the whole puzzle together. And then it's going to be like, why wasn't I doing this earlier? Well, it's true. As you progress, you know, you go, I remember when I was shooting a volleyball at 15 yards Mm -hmm. and I was so stoked (laughs) to put six arrows in a volleyball at 15 yards. Yeah. Now, if I'm not putting an arrow in the X at 15 yards, I'm like, ah, it's a bad (laughs) shot process. Right. Right. Like, yeah. So it just, it's, it's just a process we go through and yeah, same thing for me. Somebody told me one day, and they ruined my life when they told me that. <laughs> They're like, hey, you know, you're shooting wrong. I'm like, what do you mean I'm shooting wrong? That thing's money. Mm-hmm. But then you start thinking about it, and yeah, you have those off days where you just can't hit your ass. You know, the guys that I shoot with at 3D shoots and stuff, if I'm punching the trigger or if I start not executing a shot, they let me know. Yeah. And I feel like two people are too proud. Mm-hmm. to. I'm like, And if I'm doing that, I want to know because a lot of times it's subconscious. You don't even know you're doing these things. Right. So let's talk about the proper shot process. We'll go through just your big three kinds of, of triggers that people are going to use. So okay. we'll talk about an index release, a thumb release, and a hinge, yeah. right? So you you shoot a index, so I shoot I'll a, let you uh, take that over. Yeah, I shoot an index release or, um, you know, basically just a regular trigger release. Yeah, a trigger. And, uh, Activated uh, with your index a, finger. A wrist, a wrist rocket. Um, I don't use my, my, my index finger. I use my whole hand. Right. Um, there's a reason I do that. It's because it's way too easy to punch oh, yeah. the trigger with one finger. If you activate your whole hand or use your whole hand, you're relying on much more than just a finger. And you can slowly, more securely, at least for me, and this is the way I've heard it from another championship archer, um, that if you if you just slowly make a fist while keeping tension on your on your elbow and then bringing that elbow back and then trying to act like you're pinching this pencil with your shoulder blades yeah. and like you're going to try and hold it there together, you're kind of going like this. And so when you see these pro archers execute a shot, it goes like that. Yeah, they break apart. That's and... why they yeah, it's called it's called getting a good separation on the shot or getting a good break. Sure. And uh, you know, you could do that with it with an index. It is probably ten times harder to do that with an index than it is a hand release, uh, which I shoot the uh, the HBC Honey Badger, uh, or whatever they call it, by True Ball, True Ball yep. um, HBC a hinge release, and I could kick my own butt shooting against myself if I shot with the hinge versus the trigger. Oh yeah, hands yeah. down, not I, even down. I, I feel fifty percent more accurate with I have my a hinge. Carter Honey Two is the hinge that I shoot, hmm. and same thing, man. I'm. It's lights, light day. Lights out with a hinge. Yep. yep. And like I said, this year that shot I took on that bull mm-hmm. is 52 yards, and I just drew and anchored like there was nothing <laughs> in the world that could have stopped me from making a perfect shot. Yeah. Like, so much confidence with a hinge. And you're probably the same way. When you're looking at X's with a hinge, mm-hmm. like... <laughs> I'm surprised when they don't go there. Yeah, you're you like, know? what happened? And that's yeah. when you can really break down your, uh, yep. your, your flaws in your form. So with a hinge, you... You would draw an anchor basically with your forefinger and your middle finger Mm -hmm. straddling your jawbone. Mm -hmm. And then for me, I just kind of relax my index finger. Mm -hmm. I keep that that squeeze in my back. And if you're going to execute any release properly, Mm -hmm. it's going to be squeezing your back. But 99% of us don't do that when we're shooting at something. Adrenaline (laughs) takes over. So so you get anchored there. And as you're squeezing through with your back... And I just relax my index finger, squeeze, 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 boom, and it breaks, right? Mm-hmm. And you, you get that motion like that. Yeah. And you notice... It feels good. You notice it does. It feels great. Yeah. But you notice if you go from shooting something that you're you're consciously activating the trigger on, then you go to release. I shoot left-handed. I always shoot right. And you probably shoot left with your hinge. Mm-hmm. Because that follow-through is going... For me, at least, I, I consistently shoot right compared to my thumb release because... I shoot uh, a little lower. Lower? Yeah, I add two yards onto my onto my pot pile, okay. and I shoot. Maybe that's just where you're anchoring. It, uh, it a lot of it is uh, the the different style of hooks. So a caliper release, if you're using a caliper right. release, it goes like that. If your hook's like this, it's putting a little bit. It's it's the way that the string reacts against um, the hook or the release. It's just a different style. So different releases will cause you to shoot differently, even though you, nothing's really changed. Right. And then we take a thumb release. I know you're not a fan. <laughs> 
You can still punch. Tr- yeah, I don't. Oh, know. you can punch it easy. You can punch so it. So with a thumb release, though, I you're feel gonna like guys draw. Use that as a pl- as a placebo. Oh yeah, that's what it was for me. <laughs> Until I went to just a hinge. A hinge. That's what's fixed me so far. Yeah. And and you could take the same principles you learned shooting a hinge to an index or a thumb release. But I think it, it closely relates more to a thumb release. But in the long run, I think you're better off with a right with an index going from a hinge to an index. So with a thumb release, you're gonna draw. And I I set the thumb trigger way deep in my mm-hmm. in the last joint on my thumb. And then just kind of same thing, relax my index finger and pull, pull, pull. And you can get that same surprise release mm-hmm. with that as you can with anything else. Well, absolutely. If you if you execute a shot properly, all the executions, when the shot goes off, should feel the same. It should have the same effect. Right. You should get that separation. Now, with a lot of these bows and the let offs that you're getting, you're not, you're, you maybe the, the separation won't be so magnified. Right. Um, I'm shooting 85, 80% mods versus the 85 with the turbo. So, you know, I'm getting I'm getting quite a bit. I've even had some guys, you know, man, you, you move a lot when you shoot. Aren't you worried about the animal? No, I'm not. You know, I just, I've never had that problem because yeah. when I shoot, you know, there's always a little bit of movement. If the animal's going to bust on you, me going like that, it's not going to be it. I, I've never had that happen. Right. Um, where it's, it's you know, me shooting and moving has costed me. I think my last bow was 75%. Was it? This one's 85. Right, yeah. 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 So, along with the movement, let's... Let's uh, bump on to the next one. Yeah, so another one that I want to go over. And is I got it my the pick or your pick? Um, is it your pick? We'll go with your pick. We'll I'll go get with the mine. next one. Okay, mine will be the grip. And so okay. were you going to choose that? No. Okay, good. So uh, I have the Acubo here, and um, I it's so cool doing a live video because on a podcast, no one would ever see this. Right. Uh, but so when you see me shooting, and I'll get over here, when you see me shooting my bow, a lot of times you'll have me knock an arrow, right? And then you'll see me knock – or uh, put my release on the D loop, and then you'll see me putting pressure against my hand like that, and that's getting it in the same spot because it feels the same. The pressure is yeah, the same. I do the same. There's a line that goes down right here on your palm, basically straight in line with your index finger going straight down in the middle of your palm. That bow should be on the thumb side of that line, right? And then it should be your your knuckles should be about at a 45. Now, if they're more like that, or they're more like that, or whatever, you know, choose your lane. But um, typically, what I do is everything's relaxed. Using my front two fingers around the on That's the front of the riser, and then I'm not doing this at full draw. I'm not finding my grip at full draw. You're what you're doing is you're introducing torque. You're you're introducing way too many variables that aren't duplicatable, that aren't able to basically be repeated. It's just not consistent. Right. So get that grip now before you pull back. And then keep that grip the whole time. And then what a lot of guys will do is they'll go shoot and then they'll grab their bow. Yep. Right. So what I do is, and and that's a lot of guys that have target panic will do that um, because they're anticipating the shot. It's it's oh crap, you know my bow's went my bow went off or they they will get that flinch. Sometimes when they expect their bow to go off and it doesn't, they'll get that flinch. That's because their brain is anticipating the shot. And, and they've trained their brain to grab the bow, do everything all at once. And so that's when they, they shoot, their elbow just sticks right there, nothing moves, you know. Super rigid and It's super rigid, super uncomfortable, and just super twitchy. Right. So relax, you find your grip before the shot, put your release on there. This is my shot process. If that doesn't work for you, then find some other way. Sounds like we have a similar shot process. Yeah, but I can tell everybody for sure. What you should want to look for is not your grip when you're at, when you're at full draw. Oh yeah, that's not what you what you should be worried about. All I all I try and think about when I'm at full draw is aiming. Yeah, is that's, executing a shot. That's really all I all I focus I on. I almost don't even think about executing when you get the when you shoot enough arrows with the same kind mm-hmm. of thing in in a practice situation. Like I basically can draw, and all I just think about is burning that pin through the target. Like. <laughs> Yeah. That's what I do. I look at the target, and my subconscious kind of takes over where the pin's at, right? Yeah. You're probably the same way. I look at the target, too. If I you don't stare, look at the If pin. you stare at the pin, it goes bonkers, and yeah. then you want to punch the it. The target so. should be, typically, is is stationary, right? right? Your pin is not, and so it's going to make you feel less accurate when you're focused on something that's moving. Focus on that, and then just let the pin float. Right. And then... I try and pick out, like on a, on a critter a lot of the times, uh-huh. like a deer especially, yeah. that crease... I just the crease, a shadow, a mud a clot, hair, a hair, it, yeah. a spot, whatever it may be. I pick one, aim small, miss small, you know? Yeah, exactly. A lot of guys, I think, shoot at the, just shoot at the center of them. They shoot, when, when a lot of guys, what they do, and I see this all the time, is that they'll draw, 
and then you'll you'll see them moving their bow up, moving their bow down, typically not from side to side. They're either doing this, coming down on it, or they're doing this, and then when it goes right by the boom, they go like that. Yeah. So they're 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 drive by shooting, and that's again target panic. But um, you know, or if um, or if they're, they're they're they do come to the side to side, let me say the animal's moving. Um, as soon as it gets on that vitals, they punch the trigger. Well, your bow's still moving, so now you just probably just moved that far and you yeah. gut shot something, yeah. or your shoulder hit it. So. You have to let your pin sit for, I would say, a couple seconds before you pull that trigger, or else you're just asking for a very inaccurate shot somewhere that you're not going to like where it hits. Right. And there is, um, there's plenty of guys that I know that have that have not let their pin settle. They just, as soon as it gets in that kill zone area, they're punching it. And I'm, I'm guilty of doing that before. You know, that's one thing that when I started off hunting, you know, my first couple of years, yeah, would I do that? Yeah, I, I, I'd do that. And... Uh, you know, is, is is you get more shots, you know, you learn that it's just not worth it. Well, and you start to learn too, like that deer's still going to be there, you know, or yeah. that elk's still going to be there. Yeah. You, you draw and you anchor and you think it's this big race. And when you think about it and afterwards, you're like, man, I really rushed that. I used to do that when I started off bow hunting. It was like, get the shot off, get the shot off, yeah. get the shot off. And but now, now it's like, if I don't feel good on the shot and I've done this on probably s- half a dozen animals. I'll draw back and say it's 70 yards. It's getting out there. Yeah. And I do shoot that far. And I shoot animals that far successfully, very successfully. And say I draw back, and I may get bashed for that, but I draw back and say, you know, I can shoot playing cards at 70. The animal's feeding. Everything's perfect. Wind's good. And I'm drawn back, and my pin just won't settle. I'm going to let down, give myself a, a deep breath, give my, myself five to ten seconds, raise my bow up, Try it again. Okay, there it is. Pump, and then I'll smoke that animal. I mean, I've done that literally. I've done that probably three times at longer distances. And I've even done that at shorter distances. I've done that at 30, 40 yards. If my pin won't settle, then why are you taking the shot? You're, right. If you aren't for sure, and this goes guns, bows, whatever it may be, it's a long shot, and it's a low percentage shot if you're hoping to hit the animal where you're supposed to be. If you're if you're if you're saying oh you're so freaking dead, I'm gonna I've already got you on the barbecue. You're you're not you're yeah, dead. It's perfect. It's that's a good shot to take. Yeah. But if you're hoping to hit the hit the intended spot on that deer or hit the deer in general, you're not being an accurate shot and you're not taking shots you should be. Right. So that's why you know effective ranges are great. But maybe on that animal at that moment, your effective range is not out that far. So yeah. I don't know. There's, there's, that's a whole rabbit hole we can get into, but, um, you know, man, I, I get, I, I can get can really, get, real get deep real into this. Up yeah. So, so I don't, I don't know how we got there. So my next one, pulling too much weight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've done What's, that. The difference in, in three pounds can be a huge, difference. huge. So if huge. you don't shoot a lot, if you don't shoot a lot, 70 pounds for a lot of guys is a lot of weight. I, Solid. you know, when you're shopping bows on like say use bows, right? You're looking, mm-hmm. you see a lot of. 55 pound 65 pound bows and i'm always like dang these guys i'm like where are the 80 pound <laughs> limbs at i want to sh- i want a bow with 80 pound limbs yeah and you know we both exercise a lot and shoot our bows a lot that's a good point uh deer whisperer we're gonna get to that um you know we both exercise a lot so what is it three foot per second per pound pulled i think on average Oh, uh, something like that. I think so. So th- three the difference, to five, depending on the, the difference in saying, you know, saying you're shooting a 450 grain arrow at 290 mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. now you're shooting now at 70 pounds, mm-hmm. but that 70 pounds when you're excited and you're amped up and it's mm-hmm. 20 degrees and you got a big buck in front of you and you can't pull that or you pull it and that let off just a little too less. And then now, now you draw that weight and then you, you jump back down while that deer has gone. So now you take that down to 67 pounds. It's not going to make one lick of difference. And what that arrow does, but it's going to make you more accurate. Not the holding weight, because really with the high let off bows of today's day, the holding weight is uh, the holding weight is too. It's so small with an eighty-five percent let off, you're holding fifteen percent of seventy pounds. Hmm. So you're, right, is that kind of how it goes? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, so it is. So yeah. you're hardly holding any weight. So when you're at full draw, the stress is just comes from holding your shoulders up. I was filming you earlier with a camera and my shoulders were sore <laughs> after 10 minutes. So, so yeah. I, I think pulling too much weight is a big mistake. Everybody's chasing speed. We talked about that earlier. We are. And, and speed is important. Yes. But 
But if you went three pounds down into a hundred grain tip from a hundred and twenty five grain tip, mm -hmm. you're not gonna really change your pin gaps. Right. But what you are gonna change is your ability to you know, especially guys that hunt back east and stuff, um, you, you're drawing back and it, it just making that draw cycle easier mm -hmm. in a high stress situation, I think is is crazy important. No, I, I totally agree. And somebody's talking about turbos there. I, I, sh I shoot a turbo first year. I've shot one. And I've always shied away from them because they're way too aggressive. And I yeah. see a lot of guys who... Um, speed bows in general. Speed bows in general are. Um, Hoyt calls them a turbo. They're speed bows across every line. There are. There PSE, are. PSE, that full throttle, that thing was awful to they shoot. They are. The new Evolve cams are amazing, though. I heard um, that. I will say that, you know, for, for beginners, I would try and stay away from the turbos. I don't try and choose bows for people. I let the bows choose them. But, you know, you get a lot of these guys that, that want to get the coolest, you know, they get into bow hunting. They want to get the coolest, newest bow. Maybe High the one speed. that Cameron, yeah, maybe one that Cameron Haynes is using or whatever. And, and yeah, and, and these guys, they're, they're shooting turbos and, and they're getting pulled off the back wall, like constantly. Like, I love this bow. It's like, you know, somebody should just really be honest with you and say, you know, maybe we should start you with something with a little bit more let off or a little bit less aggressive cam or a longer brace height. Um, you know, you really need to shoot more bows. Don't right. just buy the first one you get. And, and yeah, you know, it, you, you have to bring your brain with you when you're shopping bows. Don't just buy it cause it's cool. Don't buy it cause I shoot it. Right. Don't buy a high perforce because you shoot one. Don't buy, you know, you, you need to bring your brain with you when you're choosing these bows. And, and I'm glad that somebody brought the turbos up cause I have, <laughs> I've seen it multiple times in the, in the bow shop, guys making purchases on bows that they have really no business buying. They don't have the experience. The brace height's not right for them. The draw right. length isn't even hardly right for them. And they're getting pulled. I still get pulled off the back wall with my turbo every I once in a while. I do occasionally. If I get lazy, yeah. I got pulled off the back wall today. I was yeah. shooting I saw that, that. Elite and I, I saw that. jumped off, had to come back. Yeah, so like, and, you know, it's just something that's that... That's a new bow to me. I haven't shot it a lot, yeah. so it's kind of so. different. But So what's your what's your next one, Garrett? So another one that I want to talk about is um, basically, so you're at full draw. And I call this, I went over this in the video that we're going to upload as well. It's going to be more, um, more visual than, than yeah. what we're doing here. But you're going to see me draw my bow, and I'm going to say something about being uh, having a chicken wing. And that's when you're – so I'll line up with this camera here. Everything's lined up, but the elbow comes off over here. That's called being a chicken wing, or they're way overextended over here. It falls into that draw length. Maybe draw length. But a lot of times, you'll, especially with guys that have too short a draw length, they will um, – and I'll go over to this camera. They'll be like this, and you see my elbow over here when it should be straight back. That's called being a chicken wing, and that's going to pull that string over – and it'll cause you to hit left, right, depending on which way your elbow is directed. Now, I seen that, and the guy, <laughs> I, I'm not trying to sound cocky like a douche or anything, but you know, these are things that I've seen guy and helped the guys with at the range after they ask me for help. It's not like I'm pointing that out and saying, "Hey, dummy." But so this guy was having problems tuning his bow, and kept shooting left, kept shooting. Didn't matter how far he yeah. moved his sight, and uh, I'm like, okay, and. He's like, I can't figure it out, man. And then I, I watched him shoot. I get right behind him, watch him shoot. And then immediately his arm's over here. And so I'm like, stop, let down. Okay, let me, uh, you're, you're, you're going to draw your bow. I'm going to move your elbow back. And then, then you're going to shoot. And then he freaking bullseyed at like 20 yards, 30 <laughs> yards, 40. It started going perk for him. He had to reside in a little bit, you know, but it, it was, I mean, it, he was so much better off after just moving his elbow over that much. I for mean, me, it was dropping the elbow in. Yeah, or, or raising your shoulder up, and I, I do that. Um, yeah, I don't shoot as much as I used to, but you see a lot of guys that shoot, and then the more they shoot, the higher that elbow comes up, yeah. and that just changes the uh, – it just fatigue. Change, it's what it is. It's, it's, your, yeah. it's Your body's compensating because your lats are weak, and your body's just compensating, and so your shoulder's just starting to rise high, and you're starting to lean back, and then you're starting just to use all sorts of different muscles. It just goes downhill from there. Um, but, yeah, so stop chicken-winging. Bring that elbow and set it right here. Bring it straight back and then let it go. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of these little things that we're talking about can mm -hmm. all cause form issues. And so, like, somebody can't just tell you, like, oh, uh, oh, he shoots back because his form's bad. Well, there's so many things that could cause bad form, right? Wrong, even your release being um, – I, uh, I thought about this the other day. So, back to a release like this one here, uh -huh. which is like a long shank oh. um, release – if, if you're a guy that likes to have a release tight in his hand, this is kind of how I keep mine, right? Just the, the length of my, my uh, palm at my first joint there on my fingers. So when I draw back and I get anchored and I set that finger in, 
my my anchor point is good. Now, if and I use a one with a nylon strap. Yeah, me too. Okay, so you use one like this for me. Uh, it actually really negatively affects my anchor point because I'm here. That's the next thing I'm, I wanted to talk about was anchor points, um, consistent anchor points. Mm-hmm. So another thing, inconsistency can breed form issues, right? Because now you have this super long shank and now you can't anchor where you wanted to here because this is in your way. So now you've got your knuckle way up here and then trying to anchor there you're kind of cocking your head over and then that's causing that string pressure with your nose or your face mm-hmm. and that'll cause the pull the same way. Yeah, and, and you're talking about that. That, could, that can go, go into something else. And there's a couple questions on here we need to answer real quick. Okay, let's answer those. Uh, both eyes open, one eye closed. And so I shoot both eyes open. I, show, I shoot both eyes open until about five seconds before that release goes off and I focus with one eye. But the whole time, um, and, and there's multiple reasons I do that. It's just I can see everything. I can see my. I can see everything. I can see off over here. Maybe there's an animal over here. Maybe there's something that I'm missing if I'm keeping that one eye closed. So when I draw back, up until the point where I, that shot's about to go, I close my eye at the last second and I focus hard on that bullseye. So I use both eyes, and then until about the last five to ten seconds of the shot, then I close my eye. So um, and then what was another one? So does changing the poundage on your bow change the, your tune? It does. Um, it will change the, the spine. Um, basically it'll, it'll change potentially the spine on, on your arrow, the effects it'll have. So say if you're over pounded or you're, you're under spined and you're over bowed, if you drop your bow down, um, some guys actually can tune their arrows with their poundage. If for the guys that are more accurate than others, it's called poundage tuning or whatever you want to call it, spine tuning. Um, and basically what they're doing is that they're, they're correct correctly spined but they're finding where that spine really likes to be shot at so we're talking within three to four pounds difference right and they'll they'll see their groups you know they're shooting good but then they're just looking for that extra little bit of tying group so uh, depending on how big of a change yes it can affect it can affect your tune yeah most of the times if you're only changing it by a pound or two no but that little pound or two can make a huge difference in your ability to pull comfortably it can and you know and with, so with so going from shooting that let's say a four inch group at 40 yards yeah, mm-hmm. and going up a pound, maybe when you're shooting good, mm-hmm. you shoot a three inch group to mm-hmm. me, not worth it because if you can't pull that bow and shoot it good when it matters, right? You have one draw, one arrow, one perfect release to yeah. kill the animal that you're shooting. Mm-hmm. My thing is for every tag, I generate one perfect opportunity at an animal, right? So if you can't be perfect in that one moment, right? That, that, two pounds affecting your spine and taking you from group shooting to from a four inch group to a three inch group to me, not worth it. Right. If you go up a pound and it shrinks your group by an inch at 40 yards and, and an inch and a half at 60 yards to me, still not worth it. Hmm. And that's just my opinion. If it's, if it's something that you can't shoot comfortably right. by going up a pound, it makes it a little better, but you can only shoot three or four shots like that. Right. Well now take the, the adrenaline rush of, that big buck you have on your trail camera <laughs> start, finally walks out. Now you get that adrenaline rush yeah. and pulling that extra pound. Yeah. That can make a difference. Yeah. So for me, I think whatever you shoot comfortably, you're going to shoot best. And that's all, that's all part of figuring it out. You're not going to know these things unless you actually get out there and shoot your bow often. Right. And shoot it often. And I mean, back when I was shooting a lot and I go back to 2000, we whatever, 10, when I shoot arrows, I shot 20,000 arrows before, before deer season between January 24th and deer season, late August. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, my shoulder is still paying the pr- the price for that, yeah. and that's when the Halon Six was new. Yeah. Um, you know, granted that was How too many, many strings. Arrows. Did you go through? Uh, I went through um two two sets two sets of strings. Bef- um, they went through the original ones, and then I bought aftermarket ones, and then I replaced them again right before season. And then your Halon got jacked, and then my Halon got stolen. Yeah. Sad, <laughs> sad day. Beautiful house in a shitty neighborhood. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. Um, but uh, you know, so poundage also that'll cause draw issues. So you know. Yeah. My shoulder guys hate my draw. I don't like my draw either. You do. You know, yeah. I draw straight to the chest. You know, guys are like, I don't, I, I know, I know, don't kill me. But, you know, just the way my shoulder works now, I, I, when I use my hinge, I can get that elbow up. But um, I draw straight down to the chest. Some guys like that. I know professional guys that they shoot proper. And then when they bow hunt, they draw straight to the chest. And those are guys that are professionals. See, for me, it's, it's, I don't know. I think since I started getting a lot stronger, exercising a lot, mm-hmm. it's, really easy for me is my bow is 72 pounds i think mm-hmm. 73 pounds something maxed out mm-hmm. and it's just kind of like a yeah perfect easy draw and yeah. i got a bad shoulders yeah but 
for some reason, that's just, if I start drawing that way, it pisses me off. <laughs> so I just have to like focus and just, yeah. and I probably shoot, I would say 10,000 arrows a year, maybe. Yeah, that's pretty good. I don't know, how, what does that average out to per day? 30? I have no idea. You're asking me to do math. <laughs> yeah, three shots a day would be uh, over 1,000. So yeah, I'd say if you shoot 30 arrows a day, you shoot 10,000 arrows a year. Is that right? I have no idea. Somebody should do, should do the math on that that's listening to Yeah, this, somebody that's listening, tell me. Is that's that... a lot of shooting. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I don't shoot that much anymore. I, I'm probably only at about 8,000 this year. But, um, you know, back when I was that's really... Weak. <laughs> You're weak. Well, I, I, you know, I did the YouTube and the podcast. No, I know. Me too. That, you I, know, because I'm like, I'm going to shoot more if I do all that stuff. No, actually, I shoot less. Fire season <laughs> destroyed me. I didn't shoot my bow for like eight weeks, really? six weeks. And now it's like, geez, yeah. what is this thing set at? 90 pounds? Yeah. Like, so well, you have to, the consistency is big. So, yeah. And, and I do agree with you. Draw weight's huge. You'll start getting these guys that sky draw. And if you go back and to the like the beginning of my YouTube channel, You'll see me when I got that. I was chasing speed, right? Shooting that I was shooting on. a 28-inch. I should have been sh shooting a 26. Yeah, shooting the Halon 6. I was a half inch too long, and I was about five pounds too heavy. And I'm sky drawn in those videos. But I'm hammering, you know, targets at 120 yards, 150 right. yards. But I'm sky drawn. And, man, you know, that's just all part of, you know, learning and growing. And, and when I when I shortened that up, my, my draw was great. But, you know, Chasing speed is not going to end up, you know, in, in the long run. It's just not no. worth it. What's five? What's five foot per second? Yeah. What's five extra run? pounds? You know, versus you being accurate versus you not being accurate, and and really any more, bows are way faster than they used to be. Oh yeah. Um, granted, I still shoot seventy pounds, but you know. Yeah, I shoot seventy pounds. I I, I got eighty pound limbs for the elite. I I, I like cause... shooting between two eighty and two ninety for for hunting. Yeah. The trajectory is great. I like the trajectory. I'm used to it. I don't have to really think about holding over if I don't have time to adjust my sight. Somebody said something about using a sling, single pin slider. Oh, 6,000 at 30 hours a day. Thank you for doing the math. I appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, it's it's really all about just practicing how you play. But um, So you, you had poundage. I had poundage. That was my last one. So another thing that I see that I that it doesn't drive me nuts, but it, it just makes it, it just makes, makes me cringe, is facial pressure. Facial. Yeah. Facial. Oh, facial pressure. Facial pressure. So what am I talking about there? So when you pull back your bow, right, and uh, I might have to, and, and your and your strings just strings just digging into your cheek. Oh, here I'm left-handed. Hard. Yeah. I can do it. You can do it. So just bury that freaking string into your cheek, or your yeah. It there's guys that do that. Right for this here. I'll, uh, and uh, it what that's doing is that's causing you. <laughs> you oh, tipped over man. your phone. What that's doing is again, you're you're adding more variables into your shot. You're adding more inconsistencies, more things that you're gonna have to be duplicatable with, more things that you're gonna have to be consistent with. And again, can you shoot really accurate like that? Yeah, you can shoot extremely accurate doing that if you're consistent with it. But again, that's going to cause you accuracy in the long run because eventually you're not gonna put the same amount of pressure in there. Right. So uh that's over 10,000 right. a year. No, it's correct. I myself, it's over 10,000 a year. So, uh, ah. you know, facial pressure and then also putting too much pressure with your nose near the peep will push your peep down and then make you have to realign your housing and make you shoot high or low depending on what you're doing there. Happens to me. Yeah. Happens to me a lot. I uh, Too much pressure on your string with your nose? Uh, my face and my nose. Uh, so, like, I'll draw. Issue. Yeah, especially I think that can fall back into too long a draw length. If you're... All these things, we're in a big whirlwind of of one bad habit leading to the next bad habit. But if you can, if you can listen to this podcast and honestly evaluate yourself and say you don't do any of these things, yeah. you probably shoot freaking lights out. But I know I. Well, do, I think you're lying to yourself. I do a lot. <laughs> I, I do almost all of these things. You know, like you know, like I said, it's it's a war that has to be fought every day. I practice more on target panic than probably most people that have target panic practice because i want to wear it wear it out wear it you know prevent it yeah and that's why i got the hinge i've got it yeah you know so. i've got it too i mean i think honestly anybody that's shot a trigger release has had target panic or deals with target panic isn't willing to admit it or doesn't even know they have it yeah and uh the, just the feeling of punching that trigger is just way too high with a trigger release you have to start from scratch and really really build yourself up or or you know Things that I like to see people videoing themselves. Guys that want me to help them, send me a slow mo video. Send me different angles. Typically, the best angle is right up here above you. 
So if you're left-handed, it would be over here. Yeah. Send me that angle down on you so I can see everything. I mean, if you want me to help you, you have to you have to send me these things. I can't just see a picture and, and yeah, how do I know that you haven't anchored into your bow yet? How do I know that you haven't settled into your shot yet? How do I know that you're not gripping your bow or your chicken wing? All these things. We have to be willing to evaluate yourself you too do. And, like, and, and take things with a grain of salt. A lot of things that we're talking about may not affect you, but they affect me or they affect Garrett, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. I'm going to put an end to my live video here because my phone is about to die. <laughs> because apparently this thing sucks up a lot of juice. Yeah, sorry, guys. It just killed like 60% of my battery. So <laughs> Did it really? Yeah, I'm going to have to end this live video, but thank you guys for following along mm -hmm. and your questions and your incredible math skills. So yeah, we'll tell the, the next one. We'll keep the YouTube video rolling. So check us out on there. But... So for the guys in wrap up, so we we've gone over you know draw length, we've gone over facial uh, pressure, we've gone over um, you know another thing I want to talk about is stance. Um, I'm not going to tell you whether a more open stance is good, whether you're squared up if you guys are the target, whether you're squared up like this, whether you're slightly open or what. Um, you've helped me a ton with my process and forming, scared. Oh, you're welcome, man. And uh, you know that's that's a guy right there that likes to learn and and is really able to be critiqued and not you know hate the person that's doing it. So you've been awesome to work with, man. And and uh, you know th thanks for being part of the process. And 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 uh, I am talking about you when I was talking about guys sending me videos. So thanks for doing that. But uh, so you know your stance. You know you shouldn't. You should. I'm not going to say be this way or that way, but. What I am saying is that you should be here. I'll stand up for it. You should be straight up and down. Oh, uh oh. There we go. You should be straight up and down, right? You shouldn't be leaning back like this, leaning forward like that. You shouldn't be collapsing on the shot. You should be standing up nice and straight. I go a little bit less than shoulder, maybe right out shoulder width. And there's a straight line going from here down straight all the way down to the ground. So my head's not over here, it's not over here. Your spine alignment. It's not, yeah, your spine alignment is a straight line. You're standing nice and tall like you're receiving the, you know, the presidential, presidential award from the president or something. This award is going to be huge. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it's just having good, I, 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 talk, I talk about it, you know, shoot confident. Yeah. Have a confident stance. Like you're, swagger. Like, yeah, like, like you are the biggest freaking badass guy out there on the planet, you know, chin up. Shoot proper and then execute the shot. And then you'll see me, you know, a lot of times if you have a long draw length, back to draw length, you know, guys will start going like this. They'll start using different muscles to compensate for having to – it just doesn't work. You know, your draw length has so much to do, and I'm glad you brought that up. Your draw length has so much to do with the shot process, and it, it, it really affects – it. you know, your, your, your draw length will spilleth over into the rest of your shot process. Without draw length, shot spilleth over. Shot spilleth over, and it will, it will cripple you in the long run. Yeah. Um, so, you know, sometimes I may transfer a little bit of weight onto my back foot for an uphill shot. So I'll, I'll transfer, I'll transfer a little bit of weight and that maybe bring me a little bit back, but I will say for up and downhill shots and guys, you know, you know, for guys that don't know up and downhill shots, you don't want to be going like this. You don't want to be going like that. You, lean. you actually do want to bend at the waist yep. and go like this. And granted, I do help myself out like that because I'll be more accurate going like this than I will if I have to go like this. Yeah. You know, it's... And it's the, um, the draw length spilling over to everything, that's another huge one. If your draw length is a, a quarter inch too long, you're you're always going to be, to me, and right. you said it earlier, you're always going to be better off short. Yeah. And so if your draw length is just a quarter inch too long and you have to make a steep downhill shot... Oh, that would be you, hard. You cannot pull through it. That would be really hard. To me, at least. You can't. And you're always going to be... I know a guy that... Uh, Derek... His draw length, I think, is 28, hmm. and he sh he sets his hunting bows up at 27 and a half, hmm. just because and and he's comfortable at 28, but he sets up at 27 and a half because he says a more accurate shorter. Yeah, so that's a guy right there. It's easier to pull. That's it's gonna say, well, I'm not worried about the speed I get from half an no. inch of draw length, which is probably six to nine foot per second. Yeah. I don't care. I don't care about the speed. Yeah. I shoot better like this because it really doesn't freaking matter how fast you shoot your arrow. If you hit something in the ass with it, <laughs> right. it doesn't matter how fast You're it's going. You're only going to miss quicker. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter how fast it's going if you right. can't freaking shoot it. Right. So uh, so I, I went over that. Is there anything else that you want to add on a shooting a bow that may cripple people up before we uh, wrap this thing up? Well, I think it doesn't go into um, actual 
uh, mistakes in any form, but it is equipment related. Um, your, your setup as a whole. So the accessories you put on the bow, having them tuned, right? So just having a tuned bow, but I think arrow selection's big. We talked about that sweet spot of speed. Um, for me, if I'm out of that realm, it kind of throws me off, especially over here in Oregon on the coast, shooting through brush. If you're shooting 260, it's going to be rough. But I mean, a lot of people do it. But for me, because, yeah. you know, now I'm, I shoot pretty quick, 285. Mm-hmm. So if I went back to shooting 255, 260, which I shot 268 last year, mm-hmm. and for the previous five years, I shot 268. Now I shoot 285. Mm-hmm. So if I went back to that, I, I can see how that would be crippling because if you can't. It, you know, if you range something at 38 yards and it walks off three yards, well, that's not a big deal with a bow that's shooting 285. Right. You know, you could hold in the same exact spot and you're going to hit. With a bow that's shooting 260, right. that may not be the truth. So right. I just think as a whole getting, you know, a lot of guys rag on bow shops, but that's where you cut your teeth at is a bow shop. So getting in there and, and, and pestering people with questions yeah. at messaging guys like Garrett that know – a lot more about shooting bows than you do or I do. Um, you know, reaching out to guys, watching videos. John Dudley, I talk about him all the time. Yeah. He is the gigantic Yoda of lime greenness. Yeah. And he's the guy. He is. If you've got a question, I'm, he's super responsive from what I hear. On Instagram, he's really responsive. If you comment, yeah. hey, John, I'm doing this, you know, he might make a freaking YouTube video just because you asked him a good question. Yep. I've done that um, too. Yep. And the guy, you know, there's so many available um, platforms for knowledge, right? You can just watch these ASA shoots or something where you've got all these different dudes doing all these different things <laughs> yeah. and realize that all it foils back to is trusting your setup and having consistency because you look at like Tim Gillingham does the craziest shit. He does all and, sorts of stuff. And he's a beast. And then like Levi, he talks about it. He's like, oh yeah, these guys are going to hate me, but I don't even pull through my hinge. I just roll yeah. my hand over. Yeah. And and all for years everybody tells you no you have to pull through right and he just says I don't do that I just I just rotate my hand and to expand on that and he says that's that's been a new revelation since the let offs have been what they are now he's like a lot of the new bows the guys don't have to pull through shots and so if you're not getting that separation don't think that you're automatically doing it wrong um, but that that is a great point I'm glad you brought that up because you know I I was using my hand to activate the hinge I was doing my uh, undoing my index finger, just relaxing it, and then it would pivot on my middle finger, and then I'd slowly kind of go like this with my ring finger. So I'd pull in and then let go with my index. You're still activating time. the trigger with your hand. You are, but that, what that would do for me is that would pull, that would change my anchor on my string. It would When I'd go, it would pull the string farther away from my face. Right. And so, you know, my elbow works for me on that one, but with these newer high lot off bows, and the reason I'm going over this, because somebody on one of these phones was saying something about what about the new let off on oh, the bows. Oh, yeah. What that does is, is it lets people get lazy yeah. and get away with it. Yeah. So, you know, these these new these new fast high let off bows with 90, 95% let off, what do you want to call them? You know, they 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 work great and for hunting, they are phenomenal. Oh, right? yeah. You can hold back forever. However, if you are wanting to be a more accurate archer, they're not going to keep you honest. When I get pulled off my, my, my back wall, that's because I'm getting lazy and the bow is exposing it. You're yeah. not going to get that with a 90% let off bow. So, you know... Do you want to be able to hold back longer on that buck, or do you want to be more accurate in general? I mean, you can have both, but you know it's going to be it's going to critique you more, and you're going to get more out of your out of your bow with less let off. You're going to get more speed, all that stuff. But again, some guys like that high let off. I like about eighty five. I'm good at eighty eighty five. And this 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 turbo at eighty is probably I probably should have went with the eighty fives, but you know I wanted that extra three feet per second, five feet per second. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, you, you speed know, chaser you. Yeah, I, I get pulled off the back wall every once in a while. And, and so I'll probably be going to a little bit less aggressive bow next year. But To me, it's a good reminder, though. I mean, yeah. that that little like, hey, jackass, don't be lazy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Settle no, into that, settle you're not into pulling, that anchor You're not point. pulling through. And that's why I like it is because I, I, I love being exposed when I'm doing something wrong, right? And so that bow. I just like being exposed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that bow does it for me. So when I'm, when I'm being lazy, I want to know on that prime I shot last year. It wasn't aggressive enough. It would creep off the back wall, and you would never even feel it. Yeah. And so, you know, it's it's user preference. Let offs, you know, they allow for more user error and less actual, you know, archery. Um, 
but you know there's some huge benefits to it and so sure. you need, you need to pick you know pick your poison there but well i think we covered most of i mean i'm not going to say you were you or i are professional archers <laughs> no. bow hunters anything but just sharing the knowledge of mistakes that we've made throughout the years could perhaps set somebody off on the right foot right. that like i said i shot i i would say i didn't shoot wrong but i didn't shoot proper yeah for seven or eight years, I, pro- I didn't start shooting proper probably until a year and a half or two ago, yeah. and it's changed the game. It's changed man. It, it. It's amazing. Makes how, it that much more fun. Yeah, I remember when I was like setting my big like eighteen inch block target up mm-hmm. at sixty yards and curious if I was going to hit it, and I was like stoked because I put four out of six arrows in the block <laughs> and the other two were in the dirt. Yeah, and now it's like shit. If I'm not, if I'm not in the, you know, in the vicinity of exactly what I'm aiming at, something's wrong. Yeah, and so I think as you better your, I, I think a big thing too as you better your your archery game, and I'm calling archery and bow hunting two different things. Mm-hmm. As you better your archery game, you become a better bow hunter. But to become a good bow hunter, I think that, you know, you think about it, and and you might say it took me twenty thousand shots to become a good archer. Right. We well, are never going to get twenty thousand shots on animals. So you have to burn that process in, yep. but it's still going to take time. And for everybody still does it. I, at least I do. Mm-hmm. I still draw on an animal and get super excited and mm-hmm. still make shitty shots. But my crappy shots are a thousand times better now than they were three years ago. Yeah. You know, you know, now me making a shitty shot is a lot better than old me <laughs> making a bad shot. Now it's that miss is maybe a couple you know, inches, versus a, couple a inches versus a foot. Exactly. Yeah. It's a difference between, oh, I, I didn't double lung it. You know, I hit it in the heart on accident. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so I think just, um, don't, don't get down on yourself making bad shots on critters missing. Right. Right. Um, because everybody talks about that. It's going to happen. You're going to miss. <laughs> I've missed more things than I've successfully shot. Right. Um, and, the more opportunities you give yourself, the better you're going to get at executing properly when you're put in that high pressure situation. For sure. And and to expand off of that, guys, and we'll wrap this thing up here. You know, I, I got real excited on that mule deer this year. I drew back on him and my pin wouldn't settle. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, damn it. You know, like I waited too long for this. I This is the deer I wanted. And so I, you know, at full draw, I'm like, I, he, I may not get a draw again on him. So what I did is I took two deep breaths and I just, I just didn't even look through my housing. I just kind of went like this, just, you know, just calm down, you idiot. And then look back through my peep. There it was punk and gone, you know, and just having enough self-control, you're, you're only going to get that through more shots, through more shot processes, through shooting at more animals. Too many guys, and I know this because I've seen it and I've done it myself for years. Too many guys go into a shot knowing they're going to shoot. Yeah. Prior to drawing on that, can't animal. let down. You can't, they can't let down. You see it all the time in target archery, but you see it a lot in bow hunting. We hear Snyder talk about it a lot too. Really, Aaron Snyder. Oh, he says, uh, guys, guys draw and they think they have to shoot. Yeah. Well, you don't have to shoot, idiot. You can just draw and then decide it's not going to work yeah. and let down. I'm and more, guess what? Yeah. You're you're going to find another animal. Yeah. You know, I'm more impressed you... with a guy that has enough mental toughness to let down than a guy that gets a shot off that he shouldn't have. Right. Would you rather yep. let down and say, yeah, I let down and I didn't fill that tag today, but yep. I'm going back out tomorrow? Yeah. Or do you want to not sleep all freaking night because you smelled your arrow and it smells like guts? Yeah. You know? Yeah, well so, put. Well put. To wrap it up, I think my closing thoughts have already been ran through. I, I think just <laughs> practice makes per- perfect. Practice makes perfect. Yeah. Well, if, if you guys uh, want to follow Royce, you know so we may be getting some guys that haven't seen Royce. He has the Bow Hike podcast. Yep. You know, good friend of mine. Um, go listen to the Bow Hike podcast. It's more. Well, I guess this is the Bow Hike podcast. Uh, this is will be a co episode. Co episode. Um, so co sleeping. The Bow Hike podcast is a little bit more loose and <laughs> uh, less PC. I, less PC. It's fun to listen to good guests. Uh, you get a good sense of humor on that podcast. And what's your, what's your Instagram handle? RBC underscore hunts, RBC underscore hunts. Go follow him on there. And you know what? Tell him that Garrett sent him. So he knows how many people we followed. <laughs> he sent him yeah, over. You're there. still not getting a free hat. I know. <laughs> and, uh, in, in for, for he's on, he's on YouTube as well. Doesn't really do much on there yet. Yeah. But if you want to get ahead of the curve on that, it's uh Royce chambers, his name. Yep. He'll pull right up and then has the bow hike emblem right at, right yep. there on the podcast. All that's on there pretty much worth watching is my fall bear video. 
Yeah, and the, it was a well done video. It, it looks like something I would have done. I it was mean, with a rifle. Same exact style that I like. You don't sound cocky at all. Oh what? yeah, it looks like something I would. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I meant like the style of edit. Yeah. So. All right, guys. Well, I think uh, we could wrap her up, huh? As always, guys, thanks for watching. Subscribe if you want to see more. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you for listening to the <laughs> On Point Podcast. And break, thank you for listening to the Bow Hike Podcast. <laughs> we'll see you guys on the next one. Bye. All right, guys, that's this week's episode of the podcast. Thank you, Royce, for coming back onto the show. Thank you for tuning in. And I want to give a shout-out to Black Willow Coatings, who made me some custom on-point arrows, and they look amazing. And not only do does the coating stand out way more than any wrap I've ever had on my arrow, it's, it's twice as long as the wraps that I currently use, and they're lighter. So there's a lot of benefits to these things. He guarantees the coating for a year. And uh, just really impressed with pretty much the overall quality, but how – much these things actually stand out they are super bright so uh really impressed with his work great guy riley out of louisiana doing some really good work so if you're looking to customize your arrows or just get something that stands out a little bit more or whatever it may be get a hold of riley at black willow coatings and give him a shout out i posted these uh, arrows on my instagram i also uh, tagged him in the posts so if you want to get more information you can do that um, check out my Instagram if you guys want to see the on-point arrows. And these things are pretty awesome. I cannot wait to use them on my next hunt. They're going to look pretty cool in the quiver. So, all right, guys, that's this week's episode of the podcast. As always, leave a five-star review with a comment. Get yourself entered in these giveaways that I'm doing. And I will see you on the next one. Bye.